Please turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy 1, verses 8 through 11. These are the words of the Apostle Paul. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. Amen. Well, now let's once again look to God and ask for his help as we come to his word this morning. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and ask that you would teach us your word, that you would write it upon our hearts. To that end, grant us your Holy Spirit. I cannot preach to the profit of your people without the help of the Spirit, and none of us can hear for the good of our souls without the same Spirit's help. So we are pleading and we ask that according to Jesus' promise, you would grant your spirit to your children who ask. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen. Well, last week I preached, and part of the message was from this text in 1 Timothy chapter 1, and I preached about the use of the law, and specifically you'll recall if you were here that I preached about the third use of the law. And when I came down to verse 11, I made the point that the law and its use, its right use, remember what Paul said in verse 8, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. The law, when it is rightly used, is not contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But Paul says that this proper use of the law that's the point he began with in verse 8, is, according to verse 11, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God. The law is, if rightly used, according to the gospel. When I made that point last week, and I only had time to briefly mention it, I remarked that, God willing, in the coming times that I preached, I would address the subject of the law and the gospel. And that's what I plan to do today and for another Sunday or more beyond today as well. I want to address, this, address the subject of the law and the gospel and how those two fit together as Paul here asserts that they do. This is a significant question it has been a significant question since the time of the Reformation. If you read Reformation confessions, you'll see that this subject is addressed in those confessions. Some have a separate heading entitled Law and Gospel, and really it was even a significant question before the time of the Reformation. As I believe I would have mentioned last week, it's a question really of special significance today in our day and age because there is great confusion on this subject of law and gospel. Confusion even regarding this subject that has in many ways been thought through and written about over centuries in the Christian church. And so I think it is important that we focus our attention on this issue of the law and the gospel. And I want to begin this morning by giving some definitions to start out. I'm discussing the subject of law and gospel, so I will define those words. First of all, the gospel. What is the gospel? Well, let's turn to just one passage as we consider this subject, 1 
Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. First Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. These are Paul's words, and he writes here, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So he's speaking about the gospel, and now, beginning at verse 3, he's going to tell us essentially what that gospel is. He says, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. And here it is, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to to the scriptures. And that essentially is the gospel. His point is that God made promises in time past, and now God has done what he promised to do. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world, and Jesus Christ, through his work, reconciled men to God. They were at odds with one another, as scripture says, men were alienated from God and there were enemies in their minds. But Christ has reconciled men to God. Christ has spilled his blood in order to forgive the sins of his people. He has so worked that he has brought eternal life to all who believe in him. He has redeemed us, as the scripture says. He has purged our sins. He has taken them away from us. He has appeased the wrath of God that was against us because of our sins. And this he did by his death on the cross, by his obedience in our place, by his rising from the dead. This is the gospel. Gospel, that Greek word for gospel, literally means the good news. And that's what this is. As it says in Romans 1.16, it is this message, the gospel, that is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel is the message of salvation in Christ. And there's another way we use the word as well. We use uh, the word gospel to speak about the Bible's account of Christ's life and teaching and work. We speak about the gospel according to Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. Or sometimes we call the gospel the preaching of that message about Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. It's what Christ has done and it's the proclamation of it. And of course, it's the gospel that makes us ask this question about gospel and law and how they fit together, because some people seem to think that now that the gospel has come, there's no place for the law anymore. Well, we'll get to why that is in a matter of minutes, but for now, there's the gospel, the message of salvation in Christ. But then the second definition, or the second word that we need to give definition for is law. What is the law? Well, just in a short definition, the law is God's will for us. It is his commandments. That's what the law refers to. And if you're familiar with the Bible and have studied it much for long, you are aware that the Bible uses the word law in different ways, uses it in a number of different ways. And no doubt this is part of the reason for the confusion that exists about this subject that we are discussing this morning. One of the uses of the word law is simply to speak about the word of God. It's a very general use of the word law. Let's turn back to that psalm that we looked at earlier this morning, Psalm 119, and notice verse 18 of Psalm 119. Psalm 119. 
Many times the word law is used especially to refer to God's commandments, even in this very psalm. But I think in this verse it's used in a more general way. It's a familiar verse to us. Some of us pray it very frequently, maybe when we sit down to read our Bibles, maybe when we come to hear a sermon. I think I frequently use this verse in prayer as I begin one of my messages that I preach. Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. And when we use the word law in that way, we mean the word of God in a general sense. The thing We want to see the things God would teach us, the things that God has revealed to us. Whatever part of the word of God, whether it's specifically law and commandments, or whether it's simply a story about Jesus Christ, we use this word law to refer to all of that. And when I say it refers to the Word of God, it's, a, it's especially used to refer to the Bible. We call the Bible, in a sense, the law of God, especially the Old Testament, is called that. The word might be used to refer to the whole Old Testament or simply to part of the Old Testament. Let's turn to a few texts in the New Testament where we see that. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 21. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 21. Paul uses the word law to refer to the whole of the Old Testament. He says there, as he begins, as he introduces a quotation from the Old Testament, in the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people, and yet for all that, they will not hear me, says the Lord. Now, the text he is quoting is from Isaiah 28. So it's not from the law in the sense it's not one of the Ten Commandments or one of the five books of the law, the law of Moses. It comes from the prophets. So Paul is using the word law here simply to mean the Old Testament, the Bible that they had at that time. It's the Word of God. Or you're familiar with the way that the law might just be re used to refer to part of the Old Testament, just look back for a moment at Luke 24 and verse 44. Here we have the incident in which Jesus, after he rose from the dead on the first day of the week, was walking later in that day to a town called Emmaus, or toward that town, with two men who were headed there, two disciples, and he had a conversation with them. And this is a brief part of that conversation. Then he said to them, so Jesus is speaking to, the, to these two disciples, and he says, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. So you see how he uses the word law there. It's referring just to a part of the Bible, the five books of Moses. So in this way of speaking, the Old Testament consists of the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. And I have a Bible in my study that was put out by the Jewish Publication Society, so it's only an Old Testament, and it has this title, Law, Prophets, and Writings. So sometimes the word law would just refer to the first five books of the Old Testament, and then sometimes it would refer to the whole Old Testament. So it can mean the Word of God. And then there's another use of the word law. It's similar to another way that we use the same word law, the English word. And that means it's simply a principle or a system. And Dr. Martin used the word in that way this morning when he spoke about the law of gravitation or the law of gravity, and the word law there simply means a principle, or we speak of laws of thermodynamics. Look at Romans 3, verses 27 and 28. Romans 3, 27 and 28. The Apostle Paul is writing here, and he says, Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. 
Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Now, in verse 27 is where he uses this word law to mean simply a principle or a system. You could substitute it for the word law. Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law or on the basis of what principle of works? No, but by the law of faith. And he means there on the principle or the system of faith. So he's simply using the word in a general way not to refer to the Bible, not to refer to the Ten Commandments or any commandments of the Bible. It just means a principle. But now there are some other ways that the word law is used, and these following ways that the law is used are the ways that have to do with fitting together the law and the gospel. So now especially keep these definitions in mind because these are the things that we are focusing on. For one thing, the word law can refer to a system of works righteousness, a specific way of becoming right with God, or theoretically becoming right with God. And law means a system of works righteousness. Look at Galatians chapter 3 and verse 11, first of all. Galatians 3, verse 11. And it's these definitions that we're focusing on now from this point on that we're going to be considering when we f see how they fit together with the gospel. Galatians 3, verse 11, the apostle says, But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. We could substitute for the word by the law there, by any system of works righteousness. That is, if you obey certain commandments, you will become righteous. That's what Paul is talking about here. And he's saying no one be, can, can be justified in that way. Or look at verse 4 of chapter 5 of Galatians. Galatians 5 and verse 4. He says, you have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. The gospel says you're justified by grace alone, through faith alone, but if you're trying to be justified through works righteousness, Paul says that's utterly inconsistent with the gospel. So in a sense, the answer to this uh, whether this law fits in with the gospel in any way, it absolutely does not. But that's one of the uses of law as well, and we'll cover this ground again. But then secondly, uh, regarding the, the kinds of law that we're concerned about, sometimes the law refers to the Old Covenant. Now, not just the Old Testament, but the whole arrangement between God and His people that came through Moses, that is called the law, the Old Covenant, or Old Covenant Law. Everything associated with Moses, the whole sacrificial system, the system of laws for the nation of Israel, all of that is called the law. Look back at John chapter 1 and verse 17. John chapter 1 and verse 17. It's another familiar statement of the New Testament. John writes, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now that would include the Old Testament, but it really has to do with that whole system of laws for the Jews, the whole Mosaic administration, as it has been called, the Old Covenant, everything having to do with the life and regulation of the life for the Jews. That's the law as well. Turn to Hebrews 9 as well to notice this. Hebrews 9, verse 22, first of all. It says there, 
according to the law. And again, it's all these laws that he has in mind regarding sacrifices and the way that God was to be worshipped by the Jews in the Old Covenant. According to the law, almost all things are purged with blood or cleansed with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no remission. You see what he's referring to. He's referring to the whole Mosaic system of worship. And then chapter 10, verse 1 of Hebrews. For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. Once again, he's referring to the Mosaic Covenant and the way that it had a certain prescription for worship had to do with sacrifices, priests, offerings, incense, many, many other rituals. And that was the law. And then another way the word law is used is simply to speak of God's will for mankind. It's God's will. It's what God expects of men, what God requires of men, what God demands of us. Sometimes we speak of the law in that sense and we mean what we call moral law. That is God's will for all men everywhere at all times. That's the law. And as we say uh, about the Ten Commandments, that will of God for all men everywhere at all times is especially summarized in the Ten Commandments. It's also summarized in an even briefer way in the two great commandments. You shall love God with all your heart. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But it's summarized in the Ten Commandments. And so sometimes we refer to the Ten Commandments as the law. Go back with me to where we started, 1 Timothy 1 for a moment. 1 Timothy chapter 1. And let me remind you of something I pointed out last week. Paul here is speaking about the law and beginning at verse 8, but we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Now, Paul is using the law in this way in this text. Remember what I pointed out in verses 9 and 10. That in verses 9 and 10, Paul goes through a list of sins, and you can follow from the beginning with the first commandment, where he starts out and says, the ungodly, and then for sinners, and then the unholy and profane. And those things correspond to the first four commandments. And then he goes on to the fifth commandment, murder of fa murderers of fathers and mothers for manslayers. That's the sixth commandment, you shall not kill. Then he goes on to the seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery for fornicators, for sodomites. The eighth commandment, you shall not steal. And he talks about man-stealers for kidnappers. Then the ninth commandment, you shall not bear false witness. He says for liars and perjurers. And if there is anything else that is contrary to sound doctrine, he's talking here about the Ten Commandments, which are for all people at all times. Or look at James 2, verses 8 through 12. James 2, verses 8 through 12. James uses the, words, the word in a similar way. He here calls God's moral law the royal law. He says, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. Here he uses one of the two great commandments, the smallest summary. Then he goes on to the broader summary with ten commandments. He says, but if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. And now again, he's going to define what law he's talking about. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now if you do not commit adultery, you do, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak, and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. So here Paul is speaking about the law. And one thing is obvious from Paul's statement 
and James's statement that he believes the law in this sense, the Ten Commandments, is relevant for the people to whom he's writing. Paul believed that. James believed that. He says you need to obey these things, and that's why we have come to call these things the moral law, or the summary of the moral law. They apply to all people at all times in every place. In fact, James even says judgment is going to be according to this law, verse 12. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty, the law to which he's been referring. And then it could also be used just generally, the word law, to refer to any commandment of God. And John Murray makes the case in Romans 3.31 that where Paul says we establish or we uphold the law that that's the way that it's being used there. But of course, once again, that law or any law he's referring to is summarized in the Ten Commandments. So regarding, regardless, I should say, which one of these laws that we mean, especially these last definitions I gave you, a system of works righteousness, or the old covenant, or the moral law of God, when we speak about the law and refer to these things, this is how the, where the question is asked that, about law and grace. These are the things that are in view. And the question is, how does the law mesh, or how does it fit together with the gospel? So those are the definitions, law and gospel. And in the second place, let's just look more closely at this question about how the law and the gospel fit together, or the problem that we have and why we even have this discussion. We have the discussion for this reason, because some people say that the two things, law and gospel, in any sense of the word law, the two things do not go together in any way. Most likely, if you've been a Christian for long at all, you have run into people who have believed that. And very possibly, you have, perhaps at one time, been a person who believed that. Or maybe someone I'm talking to today believes that very thing. That there's no sense in which law, no matter how you define it, fits with the gospel. You think that they are like oil and water. You pour them into the same container, and all they do is separate from each other. They don't mix together at all. Now certainly, there are some elements of truth in your statement. And that's one of the reasons why this is a perennial question that comes up. For instance, think of law in that sense I spoke about a, a bit ago, a, a system of works righteousness. It's the idea that someone can actually be saved from his sins by doing good things, doing enough good things, keeping enough of God's commandments. That's what the Pharisees thought. And because the Pharisees thought that, and Jesus interacted with them a lot, and they taught the people of Israel in Jesus' day, there were a lot of people who thought this way. And so Jesus was constantly combating this, and so were the apostles, especially the apostle Paul. Turn back to Galatians 3. Galatians chapter 3. Let's consider some of the definitions of the word law and see what we see in some of these epistles about the law and how it relates to the gospel. One of the definitions was the old covenant, the mosaic system, the sacrifices, the priesthood, and all of that. How does that fit in with the gospel now? Well, the Bible teaches that that all, the Old Testament system of worship, is done away in Jesus Christ. Galatians 3, verses 23 to 25. But before faith came, we were kept 
under guard by the law. That means the old covenant, the Mosaic system. We were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. So the old covenant was a tutor, a guide to lead us to a certain point, but it no longer is now that the gospel has come. And then verse 28, there, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. The old covenant not only told the Jews about a special way that they were to worship and not us, but it also had laws that separated them from all the rest of the world. So there was a difference, in a sense, between Jew and Greek. But those laws and that system of law are done away with in Christ, and they no longer are relevant. So the old covenant does not fit with the gospel. But then what about the law as the Ten Commandments? The Ten Commandments were an integral part of the Old Covenant. Let's look at Deuteronomy 4 and verse 13. Deuteronomy 4 and verse 13. I mentioned sometimes the law refers to the Ten Commandments. Well, let's notice Deuteronomy 4 verse 13. Moses is, is writing about what God had done in revealing the law, and he says, So God declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, that is, the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two tables of stone. So there is the law, the Ten Commandments, called the covenant. So the Ten Commandments were an integral part of that old covenant. Now we've seen that... Paul and James both say the Ten Commandments have relevance for us, but they are very closely identified with the Old Covenant. And so you see, it's not just that easy a question to answer when we talk about the relation of law and gospel. And then turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And let's read verses 5 through 8. Here's a passage where Paul is talking about the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And he says there are very serious differences between Old Covenant and New. He says, beginning in verse 5 of 2 Corinthians 3, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? So the ministry of the Spirit, the new covenant, is glorious, far more glorious than that of the old covenant, especially for this reason. You see it in verse 6. Because the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. If we think of the Ten Commandments simply as a way for you to earn your salvation, it would never, ever work. It's a letter, Paul says, and it's a letter that kills. And in that sense, the law and the gospel don't fit together. But he says it's the spirit represented by the gospel that gives life. And then turn just back to one other passage, to Romans 3 and verse 28. Romans 3, verse 28. I mentioned earlier that law can refer to a principle that is opposed to grace. And Paul says, therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. 
So the gospel is opposed to works righteousness. And it's in that sense, I believe, that Paul says in Romans 10, 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. And in a sense, I believe in that passage, we'll talk about it later, Paul says Christ smashes that notion. All right, so there are a number of ways in which we look at the law and we say they, they just don't mix with the gospel. But here is the problem, isn't it? There are also other statements about the law in the Bible, some of which we've already looked at. There are some very strong positive statements about the law, such as here in Romans 3, verse 31. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, Paul says, we establish the law. Or Romans 7, verse 12, a little bit later, the Apostle Paul says that the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. So we heard at the end of our adult class how we have a good God who gave us the law for our good. And the gift, Paul is saying, is just as the giver. It is holy and just and good. And that one text ought to inform you of at least one thing. If you're serious about the Bible, whatever your theology of the law is, there's got to be some room in your theology to say these words. And just as we were exhorted in the last hour, that there has to be room in your theology, however good you think God is, and however much you want to embrace him, that in the same embrace you're willing to encompass his law. Because it is holy and just and good, even if you're not sure exactly how, and even if you're not sure how that fits with the gospel, you need to believe that. And think of the words of our Savior Jesus, I delight to do your will, O oh my God. And he didn't mean something other than obeying the law because he went on to say, and your law is within my heart. And Paul said later here in Romans 7, verse 22, I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. My goal in these messages is to show you how these two things fit together. Sometimes you're working on a puzzle and you have pieces for the border and you have pieces for the foreground and pieces for the background and some parts of the main picture. I think we're going to see how the law and the gospel fit together in those various ways. But one common thing that happens when you have all those pieces spread out on the table is you see a piece and you say, oh, that is the same color that I'm looking for right now. And then you pick the piece up and you look at the spot it's supposed to go, and you look at that piece, and you say, nah, that piece is not going to fit there now that I look at the edges, and you reject it because you're convinced it won't fit. And then you spend another 15 minutes looking for that piece that does fit. And you say, I wonder if one of the kids took it, or the dog took it, or they didn't sell me all the pieces. And then you go back to that piece. And you pick it up, and you try to put it in. Oh, it did really fit. And that's what happens when we try to take these things that seem to be contradictory statements about law and gospel and see how they fit together. And when we look closely and listen to what God says, we often experience that very phenomenon. Well, that just leaves me time then this morning to do one more thing. I have... Three important foundational principles, but I only get to one today, and it's this. It's very simple. That God has an eternal law. He has an eternal law. Turn with me again to Psalm 119. Is it a vexed and vexing question, how do law and gospel fit together? Yes, it is. 
but there are some important foundational principles that we need to start our study on, and it'll make our going much, much easier. And the first one is this, that God has an eternal law. The psalmist says in verse 89 of Psalm 119, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Now, the writer here uses the word word, and then his other words that he used that are synonyms for that are commandments, precepts, laws, judgments, testimonies, etc. He's talking about the law of God in some sense. Or look at Psalm 119, verse 152. Concerning your testimonies, he says, I have known of old that you have founded them forever. And then likewise, verse 160, the entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. So there's something that we can call the law of God, the commandments of God, that we can say they endure forever. God has an eternal law. As I said earlier, we call that moral law. Is the word moral law used in the Bible? No. But we call it that because we see it in the Bible, just like we call the Trinity the Trinity because we see it taught in the Bible even though we don't see that word in the Bible. And as I said, the Ten Commandments summarize the law of God for all men at all time. It's the summary of God's law that was written on the heart of man at the very beginning. It was written on Adam's heart so that Adam, we could say, in a sense, knew instinctively what God wanted him to do. And because Adam had no sin, he wanted to do those things. But that's the law written on man's heart from the beginning of creation. And the Bible teaches that that law is written on the heart of every man as he's born into the world. Turn with me to Romans 2, verses 14 and 15. It's written on the heart of every man as he comes into this world. Each year as I've taught my ethics class in seventh grade in the Trinity Christian School, the question has come up at one point or another. Usually it comes up at least a couple of times a year. Well, what about people who never heard the Bible, never read the Bible, never had a Bible? Paul addresses exactly that question. He says, for when Gentiles who do not have the law, they don't have a Bible, by nature do the things contained in the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves. So there, in a, they in a sense become God's moral law to themselves. How does that happen? Verse 15 tells us, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. So that's Paul's answer to the question, what about people who don't ever have the Bible? And the rest of that question is, are they responsible before God? And can they go to hell? And Paul answers, yes, they are responsible and they can go to hell. Because even though they can't read the law and on the pages of the Bible... It is written on the tablets of their heart in some way. God put it there when they came into the world. So the law was written on every man's heart, beginning at the beginning with Adam. But then in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, the law regulated their life. It regulated their life. But it didn't only regulate the life of people who lived after Mount Sinai did it. It regulated the life of everyone from Moses up to Sinai. Some people pretend that there was no moral law or no Ten Commandments before Mount Sinai. But even before then, even before the Old Covenant, even before there was a nation of Israel, even before Mount Sinai, murder 
was always sin, wasn't it? It was always sin. It was sin when Cain murdered his brother Abel. And Paul said that where there is no law, there is no transgression. But there was transgression because there was a law in the heart. And even before Sinai, lying was sin, and so on. But then in that old covenant, that moral law was taken up and written on two tablets of stone. But it's the same eternal law of God. And because it's God's eternal law, it was not done away with in the new covenant. But it is rewritten, the same law, on the heart. Turn to Hebrews 8 and verse 10. Hebrews 8 and verse 10. We'll just read this one verse in a larger section of Hebrews 8. Speaking about how the promise of the old covenant is fulfilled in the new and it says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. We know this as the new covenant, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now God says, my laws. And you know from the Bible what his laws are. That you shall have no other gods before him. And you shall not make any graven images, and you shall not take his name in vain, and so on up to you shall not bear false witness, and you shall not covet. Those are God's law. They're written now not on tablets of stone, but on people's hearts. It's the same law. It has a place in the new covenant, a very prominent place. That's why Paul wrote about it the way he did in 1 Timothy 1. That's why James wrote about the law the way he did in James chapter 2 and says you need to obey it. That's why Paul wrote to children in the church in Ephesus to honor your father and your mother because it's an eternal law. And that's why Jesus said that he didn't come to abolish the law, but he came to fulfill it and not one jot or tittle of it would pass away. And then he went to show how you shall not kill and you shall not commit adultery still apply to us in the new covenant. That's why the writers of the Reformed Confessions said things like this, the moral law does forever bind all as well justified persons as others to the obedience of it. God has an eternal law. That's the first foundational principle. Let me just take the rest of the time this morning for a few words of exhortation and application. And the first thing comes from the fact that there are many meanings of the word law. Maybe you didn't know that before. And so maybe that even muddies the water more for you. But take this from that fact that there are many meanings of the word law in the Bible. Therefore, if you want to understand this subject, you need to learn your Bible. It's going to be work. And you need to see how both negative statements about the law and positive statements about the law are possible because there are different meanings of the word law. And therefore, you should realize that you are going to need to study and learn your whole Bible and what it says if you want to correctly answer this question. Instead of simply taking one statement out of the Bible, a statement that maybe you really, really like, such as, we are not under law, but under grace, and thinking that that is everything the Bible has to say about the law, or about the law and the gospel. It's not the only statement. No statement in the Bible is the only statement about the law. There are many statements and we need to understand them all so we can see how law and gospel fit together. Here's a second application. And this comes from the fact that there is an eternal law. There is an eternal law. Realize that God's law applies to your life no matter who you are. No matter who you are. 
as I said, we call it moral law because we're trying to get across the idea that there are, there's a law of God that applies to everyone, everywhere, at all times, and that includes you, and that includes me. And God's law applies to our lives in some way, even if you're not a Christian. I'm reading from the Christian Bible, the Christian scriptures. I am a Christian. I'm a Christian minister. I'm sent here by God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to preach the gospel. And you say, but I'm not a Christian, so it doesn't apply to me. In other words, you think, since these are the laws of the Christian God, they don't apply to you. But you need to realize this about the Christian God. He's not just the Christian God or just the Christian's God. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth. He's the king over everything that is. And as we saw in the scriptures already, he is the judge of all men. And he will be the judge at the last day. The Christian God will. And you need to realize that those who break his law he calls sinners. And that the Bible also teaches that the wages of sin is death. That is, if you sin against God, you deserve death. Even if you're not concerned to make God happy. When you violate his law, if you tell lies, if you steal things, if you commit sexual immorality, any of those things, you're a breaker of God's law and a sinner and you deserve death. And the Bible teaches that the only way to be saved from death for anyone, whether he's a Christian or a Jew or a Buddhist or a Muslim, whether he's an American or an Egyptian or a Malaysian or an Australian or whatever he is or whoever he is, the only way for him to be saved from his sins is through Jesus Christ. The law of God demands obedience, and the Bible says Jesus Christ perfectly obeyed the law in the place of his people. And the law of God prescribes death for everyone who sins against it. Jesus never sinned against it, but he laid down his life in the place of his people. And the Bible teaches that God freely accepts the death of Jesus Christ for his people. So that if his blood is spattered on you through your believing in him, you will be saved from your sins. You need to believe in him, even if you say, he's not my God. You need to have him as your God, or it will not go well for you in the day of judgment, the judgment that is according to God's law. But you need to realize, even if you're a Christian, that God's law applies to you because it's an eternal law. There are people who call themselves Christians, who think they're Christians, who don't think that the law of God applies to them in any way. But the Bible does say that if you are a Christian, that God's law is written on your heart. So even if you didn't want it there, if God saves you, he's put it there. And that law, God's commandments, his Ten Commandments, always have told you, even before you believed in Christ, they always have told you what is right and wrong. And they always will tell you what is right and wrong. And they always will tell you how you can please God. And they will be, as the Bible says, the standard of judgment in the last day. And if you profess to be a Christian, you need to realize that they are, those commandments, the rule of your life, no matter what your theology is. And if you call yourself a Christian, you need to figure out a way that you can heed those commandments and follow them despite your poor theology. And then a third thing, and this comes from the relation of law and gospel, which we really haven't even gotten to yet. 
But there definitely is a relationship. And so, as we come to this, pay close attention. It's a difficult question, but it's not an impossible question to answer. The Bible has very good and clear answers. And you can learn, you may not have realized this, but you can learn a lot about the gospel of Jesus Christ from the law of God. It's the background of the gospel. It's the preparation, as we saw in Galatians 3, for the gospel. And it tells us a lot about the God of the gospel. And it defines the work of Jesus Christ. And we could go on and on and on. So listen carefully. And take this warning to heart. If you are a professing Christian, because maybe you have a negative view of God's law. And maybe because of that negative view of God's law, you don't let yourself get close enough to it to learn much from it. But there is a lot that you can learn from it. And if you don't learn from it, you miss out on the benefits of God's law for Christians. And you miss out on learning a lot about Jesus. And let me suggest this to you. If that's you, and you think you're a Christian, maybe you are a Christian. Like I say to people, they ask me, could that person be a Christian? When he thinks like that, or talks like that, or acts like that, and I respond, he could be. You know, there are a lot of ignorant Christians in this world, including us at many points. But if you're ignorant in that way, let me suggest this. One of the reasons that Jesus Christ is not so precious to you is because you are not willing to study the law of God that tells you how much he has done for you to save your soul and how good he is in comparison or contrast to you and to me and how much we owe him. And all those things you will learn if you will just open yourself up to the law as a good thing the way God himself says it is. And then fourthly and finally, there's this. And this comes from the fact that there are many positive statements about God's law. And I end up right where we ended up in the adult class this morning with this exhortation. Love the law of God. If your attitude is is such, and you know this if this is the case, that you really don't love the law of God, then your attitude is far from the attitude that the Bible has about the law of God. Paul says we establish the law. He says the law is holy and just and good. He said he delights in the law of God according to the inward man. Your attitude is far from Jesus if you don't love the law. He says he delighted in God's law and that it was written on his heart. Now think of it just from that standpoint. There's Jesus' attitude to the law. Here, he thinks it's great, and here's mine over here. I don't like it. I can't find any good thing in it. Well, it goes without saying, doesn't it? No matter what kind of a Christian you are, no matter what you believe, that we should seek to be like Jesus, shouldn't we? And you should seek to be like him in this way, the way he loved the law of God. Remember, the whole goal of salvation is to make us like Jesus, our Lord. But what if someone has a very different opinion of God's law from Jesus' opinion? Jesus says it's good. He says it's bad. Here's how I like to look at this. Take the positive statements about the law of God and start right there. Can you say the positive statements that Jesus said about the law of God? Do you say them? When people ask you about the law of God, is all that comes out of your mouth purely negative or do you also have good things to say like Jesus did, like the Bible does? You might say, well, you just love the law of God so much and you always say just the positive things. No, I say the negative things. And you'll hear me say them in these messages. I say the negative things and the positive things. Will you, I'll stand with you when you say the negative things and I'll say them. And I'll say amen. Will you stand with me and say all the good things about the law of God, the positive things? 
If not, why not? I'll tell you why not. Because you don't think about the law the way Jesus thinks about the law. The way Paul thinks about the law. The way the Bible thinks about the law. The way God thinks about the law. The way you should think about God's law. But it is exactly for someone like you that these messages will be especially helpful. Because they are designed, in a sense, with you in mind. And because so many people, I believe even good people included, have been infected with a lot of error on this subject. So a couple of more messages, God willing, about law and gospel. May God give every one of us a real Berean spirit that will eagerly listen to what is preached from the Word of God and that we will not say, I don't like that, but we'll go home and examine the Scriptures and see if these things are so. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for your Word and ask that you would take your Word and write it upon our hearts. All of your Word, O oh Lord, we pray that you will show us everything that is true about the law, the bad as well as the good, and how the law and the gospel do fit together. And we pray that you would make us more like Christ in the whole process, that we would bring forth fruit for the glory of his name. Amen.